very good evening everyone. I'm Tanuja Bandara from E16 batch of Chemical and Process Engineering Department. I would like to warmly welcome you all on behalf of Chemical and Process Engineering Students Society to today's session on Biopest Food and Pharmaceuticals to Meet Global Needs, which is the ninth webinar session of the webinar series Isotalks. Let me briefly introduce the series Isotopes, one of the three elements of Isotopes, the brand new initiation organized by the Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students, where the objective is in hopes of exposing undergraduates to chemical and process industry in order to bridge the gap between academia and industry related to the subject. Isotope initiation is then scheduled to follow by discussion series and workshops as the second and third elements. Industry representatives and academic professionals will give glimpses to the industry during Isotope's webinar series, while discussion series are expected to create a much more casual stage for industry academic related concerns. During workshop series, Students can grab the moment to gather hands-on experience working with industry-related tools comprising of simulation software, pilot scale projects, and many more. SCAPS, Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students, feel foremost honor to encounter the guest speaker of the ninth webinar session of the series Isotopes under the topic Bio-based Food and Pharmaceuticals to Meet Global Needs. With my absolute pleasure, I would like to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Bhagya Yatipantalava, a research fellow in chemical engineering on smart and faster pharma and food manufacturing of University of Melbourne. She has obtained her bachelor's degree in chemical and process engineering from the University of Peradeniya and then completed her PhD at the University of Melbourne where she focused on processing microalgae to produce novel food ingredients and high value products. Currently, she is working in a joint project with Commonwealth Serum Laboratories, a leading biopharma company in Australia as a research fellow. Over to you, Dr. Bhagya. Thank you, Tanaza. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, bio-based food and pharmaceuticals to meet global needs. Uh, so feel free to, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, drop them in the chat box or unmute yourselves uh, and uh, raise your questions. Um, so now when we talk about bio-based, uh, it's something intentionally made from substances uh, derived from living organisms, but I'm not referring here to those that are derived from livestock uh, or plants, but rather about those uh, derived from uh, cells. Uh, now, uh, let's look at why this is important, uh, because nowadays there is an increasing demand for bio-based products. Uh, uh, as food, as a result of uh, mainly uh, because of the idea of climate change mitigation. As we know, uh, using livestock as food uh, generates lots of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, therefore, uh, due to this uh, increasing awareness among people, it has led to a change in the consumer demand to ensure sustainable product and consumption. Uh, here you can see that there is an increasing demand for plant-based proteins compared to uh, animal proteins uh, uh, over the years. Uh, because people are increasingly uh, shifting towards vegan and vegetarian diets. Uh, then as a second point today, uh, uh, there are biologic drugs such as vaccines and therapeutic proteins that cannot be chemically derived, uh, which therefore require living cell factories uh, uh, for this purpose. Um, so all these involve biological processes as we are working with live cells. Uh, so my intention today is to give you a basic idea on the role of a chemical and process engineer in this context. Uh, for this purpose, uh, so I will be di uh, first discussing uh, what a bioprocess is, and then we'll be using two case studies to elaborate this. Uh, in the first case study, uh, we will be looking at the production of bioproducts uh, from microalgae. 
and then in the second one uh, we will be touched upon uh, on uh, biopharmaceutical production from mammalian cells. Uh, now what is a bioprocess? Um, as chemical and process engineering undergraduates, uh, you might have an understanding of what a process is, right? Uh, can you guys tell me what a process is or what you do in a process? You can uh, probably unmute or use the chat. Okay. Uh, so basically in a process you convert the raw materials into product right so um, this will involve several uh, steps uh, but in a bioprocess we do the same thing. We use raw materials and convert them to product, but we will be using biocatalysts uh, for that purpose. Uh, uh, so we will be using uh, uh, like biological, uh, uh, like uh, biocatalysts having a biological origin, such as enzymes, uh, microorganisms. Um, and other cells derived from living organisms. Uh, for today's purpose, uh, I will be focusing on mainly these microalgae and mammalian cells. Now, uh, why do we use biocatalysts? It would be uh, because uh, these biocatalysts uh, catalysts could be more environmentally friendly. Uh, they would, uh, they might have lower cost uh, in producing the product. Uh, and also they might be the only option to produce uh, uh, the product of interest. Now, uh, moving to the first case study on algae uh, pr uh, pr producing bioproducts from microalgae. Uh, now you might have, or you may or may not have heard about these microalgae. Uh, these are very tiny uh, photosynthetic microorganisms. So this is, uh, this is how they look through the microscope. Uh, they can convert carbon dioxide with the help of sunlight to produce uh, lipids, proteins, uh, carbohydrates, and other valuable components, uh, and also produce oxygen as a byproduct, which is another advantage. Now, uh, you might argue that these are quite similar to plants. Yes, they are, but they can be considered better because they have high growth rates compared to plants uh, because they can grow uh, to high yields in uh, a matter of days, uh, and they have a less land footprint compared to uh, normal plants. Uh, and these different components can be converted to uh, produce different bioproducts. For an example, we can uh, produce biofuels and uh, different nutraceuticals. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes, madam, we could see. Yes. Uh, yeah, so you, you can convert uh, lipids to biodiesel, uh, biofuels, uh, and uh, to produce different nutraceuticals, uh, such as uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So you may have heard about fish oil. Uh, these uh, are rich, uh, fish oil are basically rich in omega 3s. Uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids and also uh, different antioxidants uh, that are produced using the carotenoids from microalgae. And then we can convert proteins uh, to produce uh, protein feed and emulsifiers uh, and uh, carbohydrates to produce bioethanol and uh, functional food products. Uh, now I looked at what microalgae based products are uh, commercially available. Uh, so I found uh, there are different companies that are actively producing microalgae based proteins uh, and nutraceuticals uh, in commercial scale. And when it comes to biofuels, uh, so they, these are uh, some different uh, uh, companies, but there were uh, several others that are actively commercially producing uh, plant based proteins and nutraceuticals using microalgae. And then uh, when it comes to biofuels uh, from microalgae, although it has been a hot topic, 
uh, to date, uh, a scalable process has not been uh, developed. Uh, but oil and gas companies such as uh, Exxon Mobil are uh, pumping their money to uh, uh, for more research and development work on producing biofuels from microalgae because it's uh, it's a sustainable way of producing uh, biodiesel or biofuels. Um, and then uh, there are some startup companies that are looking at uh, producing biofuels from microalgae um, and. An added advantage of these microalgae, as I mentioned earlier, is their ability to photosynthesize and uh, absorb carbon dioxide. Uh, so these uh, are also looked at uh, as a means of carbon capture as well uh, uh, from these companies. And then uh, apart from these, microalgae are also used to treat uh, wastewater as they produce oxygen uh, while consuming nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. Uh, but the practical implementation of this had issues, uh, and I found this company specializing in designing algae-based wastewater treat, uh, treatment systems, which I found interesting. Uh, so as you can see, there is a huge growing market for algae-based bioproducts, specifically as a source of plant-based proteins and nutraceuticals. Uh, but converting these microalgae to these uh, end products involved a long process. Uh, now, this is a brief overview of what goes in uh, to go from microalgae to uh, these uh, different bioproducts, uh, including food and nutraceuticals. Uh, we need to consider uh, algae cultivation, where we have to look at the culture conditions to optimize cell growth uh, and select a suitable microalgae strain for our required purpose. Uh, this microalgae grow as dilute suspension. So, the next step uh, is to uh, concentrate them or uh, to harvest or dewater them uh, to obtain uh, the required concentrations. Uh, so, it, uh, and then uh, once we have algae separated, so the next step uh, is the is the downstream processing. Uh, depending on what we need to extract uh, or produce, we might need to rupture or break open the cells uh, and then extract the required components. Uh, and then separate and purify them to obtain the required purity uh, to produce these different products. In the next few slides, I will try to give you a basic idea on each of these steps. Um, the first thing is to uh, we need to decide is the strain or the microalgae species that needs to be used. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these microalgae are a very wide group of uh, organisms. They can dif uh, differ in their shape, size, color, uh, cellular co uh, composition. That is, some might have uh, high uh, protein content, some might have uh, high lipid and pigment contents. Uh, then their cell wall strength can change. So we have to uh, consider all these different aspects in order to select the best microalgae species for our purpose. Uh, now, if we look at these different microalgae, uh, nanochloroquis and chlorella both uh, look green in color. Uh, that means they contain chlorophyll A and B. Then uh, this navicular species is quite brown in color because they contain chlorophyll A, C, and uh, some antioxidant called fucosanthin. Uh, and these uh, hematococcus are red in color because they contain uh, an antioxidant called uh, astaxanthin. Uh, so, um, and, and then apart from that, uh, if we look at the cell wall structure, this chlorella nanochloroquis hematococcus will, will have cellulosic cell walls. Uh, this uh, navicula would have uh, gla gla glass like shells as their cell walls. Uh, so, and, and apart from that, this uh, botrychococcus brownie, these uh, specific microalgae has the ability to. Uh, spit out the lipids from their cells, whereas the other cells uh, would be accumulating uh, lipids inside them. Uh, but these, uh, these microalgae, on the other hand, have lower uh, growth rates. Uh, so I can speak hours about these different microalgae species, but what I wanted you to basically uh, understand is that there are different microalgae species with different properties. So the strain selection is uh, of utmost importance uh, when we are uh, deciding on 
so when, when we are going from a microalgae to produce a certain byproduct. Um, and then the next uh, thing we have to uh, optimize is, one, so once the strain is selected, we have to optimize these uh, conditions uh, to optimize the cell growth uh, and the product concentration. Uh, we can uh, look at these different aspects, such as the nutrient content, uh, carbon dioxide concentration, um, and others. And uh, uh, so some microalgae have the ability to accumulate lipids when they are subjected to uh, stress conditions. So we have, if we are, if our uh, end product is lipids, we can uh, probably uh, subject the, uh, the cells to nitrogen starvation. Um, and then uh, once the microalgae are grown, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they will be very dilute. So it's important to reduce the water content, which will improve the process efficiency in downstream processing. Because if we process large bulks of uh, bulk volumes of water, uh, then it wouldn't be uh, efficient, right? Uh, so we can do this in three steps. Uh, as a pre-concentration step, we can use propulant, uh, which will improve the clumping of cells. Uh, uh, so, uh, we, uh, these flocculants could be chemical uh, based or bio based. Uh, uh, what these do is they they would make aggregates uh, of the uh, of, of the cells, and uh, it would make bigger colloidal particles, uh, which will make the next dewatering step easier. Uh, for dewatering, we can use methods such as centrifugation, filtration, or sedimentation. Uh, mostly it would be centrifugation uh, that is used for microalgal separation. Uh, so we can still dewater microalgae using the, uh, these techniques such as centrifugation and filtration, even without using uh, pre concentration steps uh, uh, using flocculation. But it will consume more energy and the time as the uh, water content is higher and the particle size is lower, uh, but will give us a more pure algae concentrate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you use flocculant, dewatering uh, de watering step would be easier, but the algae slurry will contain the used flocculants in track. So it's again a matter of finding the best suited optimal process uh, for your uh, product. Uh, and the next step is drying. This is uh, usually not recommended unless the final product we are interested in is the dried algae itself because it's a very energy intensive process. Uh, usually spray drying and freeze drying are quite uh, gentle on the product uh, and therefore are more recommended if we are uh, looking at drying the product as well, uh, drying the microalgae as well. Uh, and the next step, uh, if needed, will be cell destruction. Uh, these microalgae have quite strong cell walls. If you are interested in the lipids, pigments, and proteins inside the cell, then it's often uh, recommended to rupture, to, uh, rupture uh, the cells to break them open in order to make the subsequent extraction uh, of these products easier. Uh, there are different ways to do this uh, using physical, chemical, and biological methods. But usually the most used is the, uh, are the physical methods, such as high pressure homogenization. Uh, here we subject the cells to high shear forces to make them break open. Um, and here I've included this uh, figure of the flow pattern in a high pressure homogenizer. Uh, here the cell suspension would uh, pass through here and uh, would be passing through this uh, small gap. Uh, and because of this, it, uh, these uh, cells would be subjected to very high shear forces and will eventually rupture. And uh, this is a uh, scanning electron microscopic image of, uh, 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 of chlorella cells that has been passed through homogenizer. So as you can see, they've uh, broken open. Um, now the cells have ruptured. The next step is to extract the product. Uh, usually, if we are interested in uh, extracting the proteins uh, after the cell disruption, uh, water-soluble proteins uh, will mostly be dissolved in the aqueous section of the suspension. Otherwise, uh, we can use uh, 
alkali or enzymatic treatment to increase the solubility of the protein uh, in the aqueous phase. And then uh, we can separate the aqueous fraction using a dewatering method such as centrifugation. Uh, when it comes to the extraction of lipids and pigment, the method used will depend on whether we use dried algae or wet microalgae. Uh, if we are using wet microalgae, we can use organic solvents or these attributable solvents. Uh, if using dried microalgae, again, we have the option to use organic solvents uh, or uh, supercritical carbon dioxide. Here, uh, carbon dioxide uh, Carbon dioxide is subjected to high temperatures and pressures uh, to bring it to a, a supercritical state. So the, uh, it will have both gas and liquid properties. Uh, the process is expensive, but can be more environmentally friendly compared to organic solvents. Uh, but the most uh, used method for uh, extracting liquids and pigments from microalgae is uh, using this organic solvent. Um, the selection of the solvent would depend on the polarity of the lipids of interest because in microalgae there are polar and non-polar lipids uh, and the mode of extraction and the safety and cost factors. Uh, now to put those things into perception let's uh, look at this uh, lipid extraction system. Here we consider a wet lipid extraction system uh, where uh, so, we, so which means it's not uh, dried uh, it, it is only concentrated and devoted. Uh, for this purpose, we can use two different systems, a monophasic lipid extraction system or a biphasic lipid extraction system. In a monophasic system, we would be using polar, uh, that is water, water miscible solvents, uh, or a combination of uh, polar and non-polar uh, to non-polar solvents to extract the lipid. Uh, so if the cells are unruptured, the solvent will diffuse through the cell walls and dissolve the lipid droplets, which can then be extracted based on the uh, concentration gradient. Uh, here, the lipid extraction would be diffusion limited uh, by the cell walls, therefore it's, it would be quite slow. But if the cells are ruptured, when using a monophasic system, the lipids will be immediately accessible by the solvent. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, you are, if you are using a biphasic system, uh, we use a non-polar water immiscible solvent. Uh, that is, the solvent is not uh, mixing well with water, so we have to uh, make it mix uh, using a different uh, other methods such as ultrasonication, maybe, uh, or high uh, shear forces to make uh, to make very uh, small droplets of uh, solvent of the uh, non-polar solvent uh, to get uh, better contact with the cells. Um, um, and if the cells are unruptured, the lipid droplets uh, in this system would be inaccessible because of the presence of this uh, cell wall as well as this uh, hydration bubble because uh, uh, the cells are in an aqueous phase and this uh, 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 solvent droplets would be uh, water immiscible. Uh, and on the other hand, if the cells are ruptured, then again, uh, the lipid droplets would be easily accessible the, uh, in a properly emulsified system. Uh, now, you might think that a monophasic uh, lipid extraction system is better, uh, but uh, in a monophasic system, we would uh, require, so when, when we, uh, after extracting the lipids using this uh, solvent, uh, when we are going to uh, separate the uh, lipid fraction from the solvent, um, in a monophasic system, they would require uh, energy intensive distillation to, se to uh, separate the water miscible uh, solvent from water. Whereas in a biphasic system, uh, the recovery would be easy as we can use uh, a simple centrifugation step to separate the uh, solvent fraction and then uh, we can uh, probably evaporate the solvent and recondense the solvent to reuse. Uh, and once the products are extracted and separated from the cell debris, we can then uh, separate and purify the product of interest. Uh, so for this step, uh, we can use chromatographic separation, uh, where we use a column packed with uh, some kind of a filter material, such as resins. 
Um, and uh, we can separate them on different principles, such as based on the size, uh, large hydrophobicity, or specific uh, binding uh, capacities. Um, there are different uh, chromatographic techniques uh, based on these different principles. Uh, for an example, if we look at this uh, protein affinity chromatography, what happens is uh, the resin we would be using uh, would have some ligands that uh, th that would bind our protein of interest specifically. So when we put the uh, the collection of uh, proteins, uh, for an example, through the column, uh, our protein of interest would bind to the resin, whereas the others would pass through. Uh, so we can watch the watch the column uh, using a suitable buffer, and then uh, uh, once all the unnecessary proteins are uh, got rid of, we can uh, elute our protein of interest using a suitable buffer. Um, and then uh, there's this ion exchange chromatography uh, where uh, the binding is happening based on the charge of the materials. So likewise, there are different types of chromatography techniques that we can use in order to uh, separate and purify our products such as proteins or even uh, different pigments as well. Uh, now this comes to the end of the first case study. I hope you might have got a brief idea on the different uh, processes involved in uh, going from microalgae uh, to these different uh, bioproducts. Uh, so we we as process engineers will have to decide on the most suitable process to extract uh, the product of interest while minimizing the uh, cost, energy consumption, uh, and the environmental footprint. Um, so let's move to the next section. Uh, here I won't be going through the whole process of uh, biopharmaceutical production as the process itself uh, will quite be similar to that we previously discussed, except for that uh, mammalian cells do not have a strong cell wall uh, as microalgae, they only have a cell membrane. Uh, um, and they are quite, uh, compared with microalgae cells, they are quite uh, subjected to, uh, they, are, they are quite delicate, I, I would say. Uh, but I will briefly touch upon why this is important and the basic steps involved in producing biopharmaceuticals. And now in order to uh, produce bio biopharmaceuticals from ma uh, mammalian cells, uh, these mammalian cells are grown outside of their uh, original tissue, but in a growth medium. Uh, so here I have uh, put a table of, uh, uh, different cell lines that are most commonly used uh, and their origin and their application. As you can see, there are different cells that are uh, separated from uh, Chinese hamsters, monkeys, um, cocker spaniels, and even uh, from humans. Uh, so we would be cultivating them uh, in a separate growth medium. Uh, now, uh, so if we look at what, what uh, mammalian cells are used for, they can be used to produce monoclonal antibodies, uh, which are uh, man-made proteins that act like human antibodies uh, in the immune system. Therefore, they can be used to treat diseases such as uh, asthma, cancer, and infectious diseases. And then we can use the mammalian cells to produce viral vaccines. Uh, to manufacture large amount of inactivated or attenuated viruses. Uh, then they can be used to produce therapeutic glycoproteins and tissue uh, to produce tissue or organ replacements. Uh, now, why do we use mammalian cells for this purpose? Because uh, the mammalian cells uh, itself have, uh, they, they perform essential protein production steps that are needed for protein stability and activity. Specifically, these mammalian uh, cells have the ability to uh, do something called post-translational modifications to the proteins, which uh, the other cells, such as plant cells, are not able to do. Um, they can uh, produce these uh, products, as I mentioned earlier. 
and they have specific struct and function. Therefore, they can be used to uh, produce human tissue and organ replacement. Um, and they can be uh, used to uh, used as models in medical testing. Uh, so here I have taken an example of a typical production line for the production of uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, the first target will be to develop a cell line that produces a specific uh, monoclonal antibody protein of interest uh, stably and consistently at a higher rate. Uh, so this will be mainly uh, absorbed uh, for uh, microbiologists and biologists uh, kind of uh, uh, people. Uh, and then once this is developed, the next step will be upstream development. Uh, here, the target is to develop and optimize the conditions to optimize the cell growth and productivity while maintaining a suitable product quality. Uh, so this may involve working around the media composition, temperature, pH, uh, agitation rates, and different uh, types of uh, things to uh, optimize the, uh, the cell growth, the mammalian cell growth, and their production. Um, and then the next step is downstream processing, uh, downstream uh, development, uh, similar to what I've uh, talked about uh, in algae to bioproduct uh, production. Uh, so here we would be focusing on optimizing the process to recover and isolate the target product by removing uh, the impurities uh, to an acceptable level. Uh, here we may focus on the retention time, the uh, uh, the method of uh, separation, uh, maybe, and then uh, the pH, uh, the buffer solutions, uh, and the length of columns, uh, likewise. Um, and then the uh, once the downstream development is done, finally, uh, so once the product is there. Uh, it's uh, it needs to be uh, appropriately produced uh, with the required purity, uh, and uh, so that that would be the uh, per purpose of downstream uh, development. And then in formulations, what we do is we would optimize the uh, storage buffer and storage vessel to store the uh, protein of interest. Uh, so we have to uh, make sure that the uh, so when the product is going to the market, uh, it uh, uh, it can be uh, stored for a prolonged period of time without degrading the quality of the protein. Uh, and uh, yeah, and in all these steps, uh, scalability will also be uh, considered uh, as the final product. Uh, Product manufacturing will be uh, done in large scale for so the scientists working specifically in the upstream and downstream uh, process development have to keep the scalability in mind. And once the process is uh, developed, large scale manufacturing will start. Um, and uh, the upstream and downstream development will be mostly something uh, we can contribute as chemical and process engineers. Uh, the uh, process I mentioned looks quite uh, Simple, but uh, actual drug development takes around 10 years. Uh, the process that I mentioned uh, would be uh, mainly uh, for this period of time. Uh, so uh, in drug development, uh, we search for active substances uh, and application for patients, uh, uh, patent, um, and then uh, there would be uh, different uh, toxicological studies because uh, the drug that we develop cannot be tested on humans directly. So we would be using different uh, animal models such as we can use rats to uh, test these different drugs. Um, and once it's successful, then it will go to the next stage uh, where uh, the authorization process uh, would take place. And then the, and uh, after that, the clinical studies would start. Uh, so usually, uh, the drug, uh, so, um, many drugs would pass this uh, phase, but once it, uh, once they start the clinical trials, uh, they uh, would uh, fail. Uh, yes, uh, so it said uh, only around 10% uh, 
of drugs that are developed would go to this uh, final stage uh, where they actually go to the market. Uh, yeah, so that, uh, that's the uh, end of my lecture and I would like to acknowledge the, sorry, not the, the talk. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge uh, the algal processing group, the uh, GAS uh, research group, uh, and the Bio21 uh, Institute at the University of Melbourne, uh, and all these funding bodies for funding uh, our research. Uh, yeah, so that would be the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. And any questions I have? Thank you, Dr. Bhagya. I think that was very helpful in understanding about bio-based food and pharmaceuticals. Uh, the knowledge you shared was very interesting. I think we got a glimpse into the future as chemical and process engineers in industry and how to meet global needs in this sector. Uh, now let's move on to the Q&A session where all of you can engage in. If you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand button or else you can post any question that crosses your mind during the session or anything else you would like to know from the guest speaker related to the top topic in the chat box. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Bhagya, for the very informative uh, lecture. So um, I have one question. So you said um, there are a lot of opportunities for developing um, plant-based food products, including proteins from algae. So how does the uh, nutritional quality of algae-based proteins and other compounds compare with that of animal origin? Yeah, thank you, Shanita. That's a great question. Um, um, so in studies, it, um, so basically for proteins, um, so if we look at the uh, amino acid profiles, it's um, it has been found that they are quite, uh, comparable with that of uh, animal-based proteins, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, I, actually, I don't have the numbers, but uh, when it comes to the, uh, uh, like the essential amino acids, they seem to contain a fair amount of uh, essential amino acids that are required uh, for the human body. Uh, yeah, so they are uh, found to be quite good. But that that would also depend on, uh, I guess, the microalgae species again as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, are there like um, actually food being prepared from my like containing microalgae at the moment in the market, or is it like still under research? Uh, I think there are some uh, protein based uh, uh, protein uh, supplements kind mm. of uh, from microalgae like spirulina. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, mm. but apart from that, um, I'm, I'm not uh, like really sure about uh, how they are applied in food uh, because I, I know there are some research that are ongoing mm. uh, like to incorporate microalgae to different uh, other food products such as mm. the yogurt and cheese and mm. uh, also some um, like pasta kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I'm not really sure about that market, but I'm, I know that uh, there are protein supplements uh, produced using microalgae. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Varga. Thank you, Dr. Charita. If you have any more questions, you could ask now. And... Uh, 
hello. Uh, Hi, Tim. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, my question is a bit different from the tangent I learned today. Can you, since you are a uh, past, few, uh, past uh, pupil of our department, can you tell a bit about uh, how you, your journey from uh, being an undergraduate at our faculty and uh, uh, going abroad and doing your PhD? Can you tell a bit about that? If it's okay? Uh, it is. So do you want me to like tell about the research or the like the? I, I'm uh, not real sure. Yeah, Tilani. Yeah, it's like I'm in third year to uh, still. I'm in third year, and uh, I haven't thought of like whether going for higher studies or doing something else yet. And uh, mm -hmm. I want to get to know like how the whole uh, experiences of uh, how uh, after graduating you went to Australia and uh, did the PhD and where you are now. I just want like get to know. It. Yeah, um, so I mean it has been a long and a, a pretty stressful journey I would say, but at the end I think it's uh, all worth it. Um, I mean, uh, you, in order to uh, grow, you will have to like go through the tough situations, right? So I guess, uh, I mean, so but, uh, when I was uh, going for the PhD, I didn't quite know that uh, it would be uh, that difficult because uh, so you would be living away from your family and uh, then you would be uh, like the, the PhD work itself would be quite stressful. Uh, yeah, but you you will like uh, get to uh, like get, get used to it and you would be uh, eventually get through it, I would say. Yeah, so but I mean, for, yeah. yeah. Would you be able to tell us like what exactly you did like what exactly is needed to be done in a phd and then like what are the evaluation stages and how can how you make sure that you graduate mm -hmm. and then how is the job market like if you mm -hmm. follow a phd yeah um yeah so uh, when you start the uh, phd uh, first uh, so in, usually in Australia, uh, the process is like uh, uh, you you don't usually uh, take any courses. You would go, uh, go directly into research. Uh, so you would have a research topic. Uh, and uh, then after the first year, you would have a confirmation uh, where uh, there would be an examination uh, to see if you are progressing well. Uh, and for this purpose, uh, I mean, um, so when, when you do the research, it would be uh, like mostly self-study. Uh, so, I mean, compared with the undergraduate uh, life, uh, because in, in during the undergraduate, we would be mostly taught everything, right? we would uh, have easy access to all the materials but uh, during uh, phd research you have to uh, like find them yourself and uh, learn a lot because uh, the things that we learn during the undergraduate would uh, not be directly applicable some sometimes not be directly applicable to what we are doing uh, in our research because we would be finding uh, new uh, like we, we would be developing new knowledge right uh, and yeah, and uh, then during uh, research, I would say, um, um, so you you have to have a specific. I'm I'm not sure whether I'm uh, going on the right path. So uh, just kind of yes, me. I think Bagya she wants. I mean, uh, Tilanga will correct me if I'm wrong. I think she wants to know about the whole PhD experience because she is interested in deciding whether to do a 
higher studies or whether to go to the industry. So, yeah, I think you're in the yeah. right path. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, in the PhD, it would be a, a like a, in, in the first uh, phase of the PhD, there would be a big learning curve. And uh, then uh, you would be, uh, so you, for, I mean, you have to first know what your research question is, and then you have to uh, uh, like find yourself. Uh, I mean, the supervisor would be uh, helping you, but you have to yourself find out the uh, answers for your research question. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah, and then uh, finally, I mean, for, for the PhD, uh, for the PhDs in Australia, usually we have to have three, at least three uh, separate um, significant uh, research work done in order to graduate from the PhD. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, if we are interested in finding uh, and learning about new things, I would be, uh, I think a PhD would be a good starting point. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah, sure thank to... you. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, madam, can I ask a question? Yes, Kasim. Uh, yes, Madam. So, uh, when talking about the PhD in Australia, what are the, uh, what are the usual requirements that one, one of our students should Acquire uh, after graduating or before graduating to uh, get a uh, scholarship from Australia. Uh, yes, so uh, usually, uh, if you are looking for a PhD opportunity in Australia, uh, the first thing is uh, you have to have at least uh, I think second upper or a first class degree. Uh, and if not, uh, if not, you can uh, do or always do a master's um, and then uh, go for the PhD as well. Uh, that, that way would be also because uh, I came directly from a bachelor's to uh, a PhD, but I think uh, doing a master's uh, would also be really helpful uh, because it would expand your uh, knowledge. And then uh, to Apart from that, you have to have uh, you have to do uh, an English test like IELTS for TOEFL. Uh, I'm not sure about the bands, but uh, you can always uh, refer to the uh, university websites that you are planning to apply for. And uh, also, uh, you have to have the support of a supervisor if you are uh, planning to uh, apply uh, for a scholarship and the admission uh, for an Australian university. Uh, what you can do is you can, uh, like, uh, if you are interested in a, a specific area, specific research area, you can look for supervisors that are working on that area and write to them, uh, telling about your interests and uh, your different achievements, maybe. Uh, and if they are interested, uh, then you can, uh, like, uh, talk with them and develop research proposals. Uh, uh, and after which you can apply for the university. Um, yeah, so the uh, b before uh, applying, obviously you have to uh, have the degree certificate to work. Yeah. Did I answer your question, Kasuba? Uh, yes, madam. Thank you, madam. And madam, uh, I have one more question, madam. So after PhD, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the um, the what we see mostly in Sri Lanka is more the uh, after ha having the PhD, uh, the, the graduates enter academia. And in addition, uh, in the other developed countries, we have the industry where PhD persons are uh, uh, employed. So uh, since it is kind of uh, it, uh, Outlandish for us in Sri Lanka. Can you get an can uh, can you get an insight about the type of industries that you uh, the developed countries have where they highest PhD uh, degree? Uh, 
I mean, any type of uh, industry. So if uh, suppose you are like for, for me, if I'm uh, uh, because I did my PhD specializing like chemical engineering uh, and looking mainly on like food and pharmaceuticals. Uh, so if, if you have the expertise, uh, the any industry would be happy to hire you. Uh, and especially for like research and if you are interested in research and development, but if you are not interested in staying in the academia, then you can look for uh, research and development opportunities in the industry. Uh, uh, so in, in Australia, I think there are different uh, like bio, uh, biopharmaceutical industries, food industries, and even mineral processing industries that are, uh, I think, happy to hire PhD. Thank you, Madam. And I think even in Sri Lanka nowadays there are, uh, but but those are like there are uh, research institutes like FinTech that uh, so that also do like research and development. Uh, if you have any more questions, you can ask now. Um, madam, how um, how is the demand for this area when you go for higher studies? How to demand in, in the microbiology field, what sort of uh, demand? Is there when you go for higher studies in this area? Um, I think there there is a huge demand because, uh, like, um, I mean, do, do you mean like after getting the PhD or uh, to get uh, along the way, madam? Like after our undergraduate. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes. Yeah, so there, there are uh, like many dif uh, different research groups that are working on um, like bio uh, processing. Uh, yeah, e even, I mean, I personally know in Australia, uh, it's uh, in high demand. Uh, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not the right person to ask about other countries, but I personally think uh, bioprocessing is a, um, is an area of uh, high demand. Okay, madam, thank you. Um, it looks like we have covered all of our questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhagya, for your cooperation in answering questions and also thank you for the audience for active participation. Uh, finally, to mark the end of the session, I would like to invite Ms. Tilange Kasturiarachi, Secretary of the Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students to deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, oh, uh, I'm Oliver. Uh, yes, Ms. Tilange, we could Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor on behalf of CAPES to propose a word of thanks to each and acknowledge the contribution of everyone 
uh, who have dedicated their time and energy to make today's event a success. First, I would like to express my gratitude to our guest speaker, Dr. Bhagya Yatipantalawa, for sharing her invaluable time to share her ideas on how we as a chemical and process engineers can help the global population meet its needs. And thank you, Madam, for putting your best effort to make this event a success. Next, I would like to thank our beloved academic staff of the Department of Chemical and Process Engineering for their valuable contribution and encouragement in all our efforts. Last but not least, I thank all the participants who have joined us today and the committee members of SCAPES, without whom this would not have been possible. Thank you. Thank you, Tulangi. Every good thing comes to an end. We have come to the end of today's session. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining in this fabulous evening. Today's session is pre being recorded to be available for viewing in our YouTube channel. We hope to see you in future sessions and wish you all a very good night. Thank you. Thank you.